just focus on the truth and um I always say that it's their story you have to tell their story July 28, 1914, World War I broke out, sending the men of Britain to the battlefields. As the men were drafted to fight in the war, the women at home were drafted to work in the factories. Everyday household item factories became ammunition-producing factories, all to aid the war effort. World War I impacted Britain greatly. 1914 to 1918, over 6 million men in Britain went off to fight in this great war. Germany, Austria-Hungary, Bulgaria, and the Ottoman Empire, known as Central Powers, fought against the Allied Powers, which consisted of Great Britain, France, Russia, Italy, Romania, Japan, and the United States. Britain needed everyone to pitch into the war effort, so in 1914, women's roles in society were beginning to change. People refer to this part of history when women, quote, came out of the kitchen, end quote. When World War I broke out, change was needed in Britain. There were demands for women to aid the war effort. Women needed to replace duties working in the factories as moon net workers. Factories that produced railroad tracks became ammunition factories and produced food and medical supplies. They worked in dangerous, dirty conditions. An estimate of 700,000 women started working in munitions factories at this point in the war. Women's daily routines became waking up, working in the factories, coming home, and continuing daily chores. Often after work, women would kick around a football, sometimes even organize small games. Organizing small games spiraled into matches against the young apprentices working at their factories. At the Dick Curran Co. factory, the women footballers were especially talented. Their first organized match was on Christmas Day 1917. The Dick Kerr Lady footballers took on Coulthard's foundry playing in front of a crowd of 10,000 spectators. The Dick Kerr and Co. Lady footballers beat Coulthard's foundry 2 to nothing. They took on the name the Dick Kerr Ladies and began their journey to becoming the women's best football team for their time. Dick Kerr and Co. was founded by two Scottish men, W.B. Dick and John Kerr. Their company was the leading firm for the traction industry during their time. They were responsible for electrifying the railway from Liverpool to Southport in 1904. When World War I broke out, they turned their focus to ammunition manufacturing for the war. From the start of the war, some men's football players stayed home to continue playing the sport they loved, but were criticized and viewed as cowards for not going to fight for their country. For any man capable of playing football was capable of fighting in a war. When some men's football players went to war, many well-known idolized players died. This war led to the triumph of women's football in Britain. At the beginning of the war, football for women was looked at as a big health benefit and good for their well-being. The sport gave women something to do and to look forward to, besides focusing on this deadly war. During the 1914 to 1918 time period, there was a dramatic rise in the amount of women's football teams in Britain. Women factory workers organized football teams within Britain. The Dicker ladies gathered a national fan base almost instantly, and people would line up to watch their games. They were led by their manager, Alfred Franklin. Alfred Franklin worked at Dicker & Co. as a draughtsman in the number 6 department office. One day he saw from his window these ladies playing and saw the true potential they had. The Dick Kerr ladies' first game was at Deepdale North End on Christmas Day, 1917. They raised 600 euros for war-related charities. During that game, they gained respect from the public, being that they were playing for war-related causes. Although the success and popularity of the Dick Kerr ladies' women's football team were growing, many thought the female frame was not built for the game, and that it caused damage to women's health. The anti-ladies football lobby voiced negative opinions about the Dick Kerr ladies. This did not stop the Dick Kerr ladies. February 13, 1918, another match was approved. March 29, 1918, the Dick Kerr ladies took on the Bolton ladies and won 5 to nothing. During the 1918 
eighteen to nineteen nineteen season, the Dick Kerr ladies established a bigger audience. October ninth, nineteen eighteen, the team had their first defeat. November eleventh, nineteen eighteen, World War One ended. The men who left to fight retreated home. Because of this, women also returned home, no longer working in the factories. Attitudes about women taking over the men's game began to shift, for the men were very angry that women's football was more popular than men's. November 15, 1919, the Lancaster Daily Post reported that, quote, women were not suitable candidates for the position of a referee, end quote. This embarked the beginning of social injustice towards the women athletes. Despite the differences, the Dick Kerr ladies continued to persevere. 1919, they signed Alice Woods to the team. Another instrumental player was Lily Parr, who in her first season scored a whopping 43 goals, who would continue to be one of the most influential women athletes of her time. As football was continuing to slowly grow in Britain, it was also growing rapidly in France. The French developed a national women's team. The Dick Kerr ladies invited the national French team to come and play in Britain on a football tour. The French team arrived in Britain April 28, 1920. 25,000 people came to watch the Dick Kerr ladies play the French ladies. Throughout the tour, they raised over 3,000 euros, all to donate to wounded warriors. In 1920, the crowds were consistently anywhere between 10 to 25,000 people. In 1929, the Dick Kerr ladies were the first British football team to travel nationally. The French national team returned the courtesy and invited the Dick Kerr ladies to play in France. While they were in France, they were spectated by 22,000 people per game. As the men football players grew jealous of the Dick Kerr ladies' success, trouble began to arise. Medical professionals claimed that women playing football would cause infertility. On December 5, 1921, tragedy struck. The Football Association put out a statement saying that women's football was, quote, quite unsuitable for females and ought not to be encouraged, end quote. Many ladies' teams gave up when the ban was passed because they didn't have fields to play on like the Dick Kerr ladies did. However, the Dick Kerr ladies did not give up. They played despite the ban and showed persistence and pushed through the inequality when many women at the time did not. Although they could not play on federally owned grounds, they made the best out of their situation. They even toured North America in 1922 because they could play in other countries, just not their own. They even played against men's teams in the United States. The team was in existence until 1965 when the team died out. The Women's Football Association was formed in 1969 and the band was lifted in 1971, which not have been accomplished without their efforts. In 2002, Lily Parr was inducted into the Hall of Fame at the National Football Museum, being the first woman to be inducted at the time. In 2008, the Football Association put out an apology for the 1921 ban. This apology was necessary, but women could not be where they were today without the persistence shown after the tragedy of the ban.